So we're going to now look at some of these characteristics of, of this tough beauty. The first is what I call tier beauty. This uh, term, tier beauty, was actually coined by C.S. Lewis, a combination of tier and beauty. So let's look at angels, because angels are supposed to be very beautiful. I've not seen one in the flesh of the spirit myself, but I'm presuming they're very beautiful, being sinless creatures. So what happens in the Bible when angels appear to people? Normally, people are a bit terrified, they are afraid. This beauty is attractive, the beauty of the angel is attractive, but also it's of such a nature that they are overawed by it. Let's take some examples. Here we have this wonderful mosaic, I think, in the second century from Thessaloniki, from Ezekiel's vision. You see Ezekiel on the left there, he's, he's, he's uh, overawed by this vision of heaven. The scripture says that Ezekiel fell on his face when he saw the likeness of the Son of Man. And Mary, at the Annunciation, has to be consoled by the angel who had got to say to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. The Bible says that she was greatly disturbed at the words of the Archangel Gabriel. And again, the myrrh bearers, when they meet the angel of the tomb, they became terrified, the scriptures say, and they bowed their faces down to the earth. And Samson's mother tells her husband, after an angel has visited her, to tell her that she's going to conceive and bear Samson. She says to her husband, A man of God came to me, and his appearance was like the appearance of the angel of God. Very awesome. So, if my beauty is awesome, it's something much greater than ourselves. It's sublime rather than comfortable. It possesses a shock element. It's disturbing and awakens us. It seems to unite opposites. It is attractive and terrifying. It's homely and adventurous. It invites and sends. It's measured yet immeasurable. It's pleasurable yet demanding. One way of seeing this awe or even terror exposure to this divine beauty is to see it as a form of veneration. C.S. Lewis in his book, Tilly Her Faces, has Oriol described what it's like to hear Cupid's voice. In its implacable stirs, it was golden. My terror was the salute that mortal flesh gives to immortal things. I repeat, my terror was the salute that mortal flesh gives to immortal things. Because they are known and it's often fearsome, divine beauty, on the other hand, has to still remain attractive. It has to encourage us to step forward into the unknown. So divine beauty gives us an inkling of what is much greater than us, yet at the same time it contains enough beauty to attract us, to invite us into the unknown. The choice when we're confronted with beauty and it invites us to go deeper isn't always a straightforward one. Because some things, I would say a false sort of beauty, might be sweet to the tongue but bitter when we swallow it. Whereas eternally good things can be a bit bitter to the tongue but sweet later. An obvious example of this is the martyr. The word martyrdom, of course, means witness. We tend to associate the word martyrdom with death, which obviously it does mean in one sense that martyr is someone who dies for Christ. But the word martyr itself means someone who's witness, which does mean a word of witness. So St. Stephen here has a vision of Christ, the beauty of Christ, and that's what he covered his sin, to lay aside his own life, um, being stoned to death. So he could have chosen to something sweet to the mouth. I say, okay, I, I renounce Christ. Now, I don't want to be stoned, I don't want to have the unpleasant experience of being stoned to death. I want the sweetness of my tongue. No, I get a vision of Christ of beauty. And if I want oh, this beauty, I don't mind suffering the ugliness of being stoned to death in a temporary basis, so I can have the sweetness of Christ's word. So, true beauty helps us to get through hardship, get through ugliness, if you like. 
look for the ultimate beauty. And after all, the crucifixion of the Son of Man, the Son of God, is the ugliest event in human history. Yet, it becomes the most beautiful event in human history. Because through the resurrection, we are there to into divine beauty of the God Son. So this leads to my second characteristic of beauty, that it always brings a decision. Beauty isn't just for us to enjoy, but there's always a crisis involved with beauty. It's a decision. Yeah, I've got this picture of the um, Israelite spies being sent by Moses into the promised land. So the Israelites are in the wilderness, have been promised the promised land. Um, on the threshold, if you like. So uh, Moses tells them to spy out the land of the Canaanites and see what it's like. So they come back with this enormous bunch of great, so heavy, they had to put it on the floor. So they come back, it says in the book of Numbers, the spies came to Granny Ishmael and cut down from their branch with a single cluster of grapes, and they carried it on a pole between two of them. They brought also some pomegranates and figs. So they bring these beautiful fruits of the promised land back to the Israelites, and they say, oh, these are beautiful things, but the Canaanites are really good people, are really scary. I don't think we should go in there. I think we should just stay away um, from this place. So in fact, all except Caleb and Joshua are not allowed by God to enter the promised land. So they have an experience of the beauty of the life, the fruits of the promised land. And then, as it were, having given them this promise of beauty and the things to come, God then says, What, do you want to go in to the promised land and claim this or not? It's a crisis point. They decide not to. So none of them, even Moses, is not allowed to enter the promised land. Only Caleb and Joshua are the same to be. They said, Yes, God has given us this, let's go in and experience the promised land. So, creative beauty is the fruit, but it's not the tree itself. The tree is Christ, and we taste the fruit, we have a decision. Do we grow orchards? Do we go to the whole tree, or do we just have a bit of fruit? In meetings with angels, they should always come to us to give a message to us. They don't just say, Behold my beauty, and then disappear. There's always some message for us, and we need to decide we're going to believe it. So, divine beauty always leads us to the threshold where we must decide. Beauty does not change us, but it leads us to the threshold of change, at which point you can ask, you must say yes or no. According to St. Ephraim and Syrian, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and paradise was actually the whole created world. And he said that if we receive this with thanksgiving, it becomes for us knowledge of good. If we just grab creation and turn our backs on the dinner, it becomes knowledge of evil. So the beauty of paradise actually had a choice in life. <laughs> receive it as a thanksgiving Eucharistic preacher, or be a consumer, like a 21st century consumer, gobble, 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 and don't do it with painfulness. The Academus of Mount Athos, who prepared that wonderful book, Philokalia, which actually means the love of the beautiful. Philo means love of the beautiful, means the beautiful. Say this What is the human person? Truly, is nothing other, we are nothing other than an image and an icon of all the graces created by God. But God gave us a law regarding the beauty of paradise as a test of freedom. If we kept that order, and kept that command, we were to receive as reward the grace of deification, becoming God's created gods and radiating pure light for all eternity. So the beauty of Eden was the setting for this all-important choice. Shall we obey and love the one who created all the splendor? Or shall we grab it, turn our backs, and run? Shall I embrace the Creator in and through creation? Or shall I take the gift and turn my back on the gift? So this leads to my third point, that beauty and the word go hand in hand. 
the system, not to say the system. If we you think of the beauty of the transfiguration, and of course it is an incredible event, an event that reveals the, the glorious splendor of Christ's divinity as an unnamed flesh. But when did this event occur? It occurred a few days before Christ's crucifixion. And one reason Christ was transfigured there was to give a taste of his divine beauty to the three disciples. So when he did suffer, when he was crucified, they wouldn't lose hope. This beauty was like great from the promised land of the resurrection. Of course, as it was, like most of Israel hopes, they forgot this event and they panicked when they saw Christ suffer and die. But if they remained in that, that fruit of beauty, they would have thought, this was no ordinary man, this man who was suffering on the cross before us, he must rise again because we saw his glory. So there is a crisis point in the disciples. Do I remember the sublime beauty and what it carried me through the suffering we all experienced when Christ suffered? Or will I forget it? So beauty and the word go hand in hand. St. John, of course, in the Gospel of John, talks about the second person of the Trinity as Logos. Now, the term Logos here is translated normally as word, but at the time that St. John was writing, the word Logos had a very full meaning for the Stoic philosophers and also for the Jewish philosopher Philo of Alexandria. So, at that time, the word Logos meant not just word, but the animating and ordinary principle of the whole cosmos. It's like it also indicated um, this, this animated spirit who was the artist who created the world, and kept it in existence, kept it beautiful and ordered, but like the conductor of an orchestra. So this word logos had tremendous meaning, but above all, it was a union of word, of reason, and physical beauty, the order of the cosmos. So when Christ said that the logos became flesh, he was saying that Christ the Logos is speaker and artist, word and creator and sustainer of the material world. I think this period, this union of word and image, is nowhere more graphically expressed than in Moses' encounter with God in the burning bush. Um, before we go into that, let me go back. I just wanted to show these two um, images here of Adam and Eve with the grapes being cast out of paradise. Uh, it uh, emphasizes this fact that the beauty that they experienced through the uh, created world uh, was also linked with the word spoken to them by the Father, saying that, I don't know, like Jehovah, um, saying that if, if they didn't really take the clear knowledge of the reason. So the beauty of paradise always went hand in hand with the commandment. So here we have Moses' son um, experiencing God with the burning bush and taking his, his sand out. So let's go through this event, which reads from Exodus chapter 3. Moses led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the house of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from the burning bush. Moses saw that though the bush was in fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see the strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, the Lord called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses replied, Here I am. So let's go through these stages. First, the bush begins to burn. I like to say that, in fact, Nothing really changed in the bush. It was always burning in God's presence. The Logos got any created this bush, but he remained in it, keeping it in existence. So, really, what changed wasn't so much the bush. It was the eyes of Moses that had been opened that far to see the bush as it always was, burning in God's glory. But anyway, he sees this beautiful thing. And he doesn't just stand there and look, he goes toward the beauty, he wants to find out more. And then God speaks to him through the bush. So here, beauty and the word go hand in hand. 
What happens? You can't speak to him. The Bible says that at this, Moses hid his face because he's afraid to look at God, the whole thing, and tear you to the tear of the music that you have. And as we know, the conversation goes on, and God tells Moses he's going to use him to deliver the Israelites from the promised land. Then the conversation goes on, Moses starts He's had a bit of a bad time there. He tried to free the Israelites by his own power by killing the Egyptian. And he's got to flee for his life. So um, he doesn't get up to the task, really. But in the end, God has spoken to him and he's got to believe or not believe. So beauty draws him, the word speaks into crisis, and he's got to decide is he going to enter the eternal beauty? Is he going to obey the creator of beauty? So the visual beauty of the icon cannot be separated from the word. Beauty attracts us to the good, while the word tells us how we can become good. Goodness and beauty are all to do with relationship in the end, and relationship requires communion to speak with the other, know the other person's will. So often we draw to someone because of attraction, but then we want to talk with them so that um, beauty is the first step sometimes, but then it's always fallen up by the communion of the word. I like to think of beauty, divine beauty, as the fragrance. Imagine ourselves walking along the street. It might be in London, lots of cars and smells we don't like them. But we walk along the side wall, and we smell this amazing fragrance. Where's that from? We, we realize it's from behind this wall. So we, it's a very long wall, and we keep walking around, we can't find the entrance, we want to find the source of this amazing fragrance. So we bump into someone and we say, This is amazing fragrance coming from the wall. Do you know how I can get into this enclosed garden? So they say, Oh, you're lucky, I, I know actually the, the entrance to this garden. So he leads into the gate, and he enters and finds the source of this wonderful fragrance. So the beauty of fragrance attracts the person. But he needs the word to guide him to the source of the fragrance. Another way to think of the beauty of the icon and its link with the word is the original meaning of the word mythos. I can, we can think of the icon as the true myth in the original sense of the word. Mythos is a Greek word and it means anything that is transmitted by word of mouth rather than by being written down. So mythos originally would be someone writing and um, perhaps writing initially just to sort of help them create the myth. And then they would recite it and people would remember it and then pass it on by word of mouth. So this requires personal relationship. If you've never written a book, you can read it by yourself. But if something is handed on by word of mouth, you've actually got to be with them. You've got to hear it. They've got to communicate with your own lips. And we've got to hear it when we're near us. Because of this personal element in the, um, in the tradition of the icon, the icon doesn't exist apart from the liturgy, which is the spoken and active and performed and smelt worship of the church. Um, it's always an element of timing. So good storytellers have consummate timing, don't they? We can read verbatim a, um, an account of a comedian's um, skit, but there's no time to all actually with the comedian. They time things so beautifully, they take it into it. And in fact, one of the Greek words for beauty, apart from kalos, is oreos. And this Greek word is a combination of aura, hour. It really comes from the word meaning hour, time. So something is beautiful because it's done in the right time. If someone um, has an auction, they know that if the blossoms come out in the wrong time, they'll probably be killed by frost. So the flower, to be truly a flower to fulfill its function, to be fertilised and produce seed, then produce more flowers, it must be beautiful in the right time, in the right hour. So this explains why icons must be liturgical ultimately. We have this icon exhibition, which is fantastic, but their true environment, of course, is the liturgy, where they're processed, they're venerated, 
pedestal icons are brought out on the feast so that they're part of a larger dynamic symphony. I mentioned about the beauty of the flower, the need to be fertilised. This leads me to my fourth point about um, beauty. The beauty goes hand in hand with repentance. Um, it has a uh, function beyond just being looked at, just like a flower. Beautiful as it is to look at, has another function as well, which is to be fertilised, to die, so to produce fruit, and produce seed, which then becomes another another plant. You can see here, uh, this is the Greek word Oreos, Timeless. This is the, uh, the icon of the ministry of the church. So beauty and repentance. Repentance uh, in the Greek uh, metanoia is often translated as change of mind. But I think the term noia, noia is from noose, is more fully a change of how we see things. The word noose in the Greek really means the eye of the heart. It's not just our rational mind, but it's the eye of the heart how we see the world. So if we change the way we see the world, it will change the way we act. And divine beauty invites us to see the world differently, so we can act differently. I think, in fact, most of our wrong action comes from the wrong way of seeing. If we see a homeless person on the street, and we say, gosh, he's rubbish, we're not going to do anything. But if we see the image of Christ in that person, we can act differently out and we're going to see Christ suffering, we're going to do something. St. <coughs> John affirms, St. John Chrysostom affirms this need to see the beauty of the Lord sacramentally and Eucharistically when he writes, the sky is beautiful. But it is so in order that you may bow down before him who made it, the Son of Christ, but it is so in order that you may worship its author. If you stop at the wonder of creation and get stuck in the beauty of his works, the light will become dark for you, or rather you have used the light to change into darkness. So the ultimate repentance that the icon calls us to is to see the world of God's actions, even actions that seem disastrous like crucifixion, of martyrdom of someone, to see them as they are in God. To see beauty as a gift of beauty and therefore that it abound for thanksgiving. And I think this is why the Eucharist is at the heart of our life. Eucharist means thanksgiving. Really, I think the heart of the fall of humankind, the fall of Adam really, was thanklessness. Because they didn't give thanks, the world became dead to them, and the sword was on his. The ring on my finger is either a bit of gold, which is in a circle, or it's an expression of my wife's love for me. Two different, completely different ways of seeing this world ring. So how does the icon help us to repent? How does it help us to turn our moose to see the world eucharistically? I look at a number of forms of perspective that the icon uses. Often people say that our oh, icons don't use perspective. But in fact, I would like to find seven different types of perspective used. We shouldn't limit perspective just to the mathematical notion of perspective developed in Italy in the 15th century. There are many different types of perspective. So I'm going to mention four here. It too much subliminally if we experience to icons long enough change. The way we see things. So, first of all, more for new perspective. Um, if you look at the building on the top right hand corner, the left half that the ring on is viewed, depicted as a view from the front, whereas the right half of it is as though we're viewing that building from the right. So, we're seeing that building from the front on the right and precisely at the same time. And even the, the bearer of the Virgin is lying on. Um, it's sort of, it's sort of a view from above and in front at the same time. So there, we're, we're invited to see the world in God, because God, of course, is limited to space and sees things all around, more from perspective. The next form of perspective views is the fire is sometimes made there. So this is Pentecost, but we notice that people fall back, further back, actually larger than the disciples at the front. 
So why is this? In love, nothing is distant. I was just saying to someone two days ago that it's difficult to believe that while we're here comfortably living in a nice warm room, at the same time, millions have got rid of it as a of salvation. Well, not in love, they're distant, they've got nothing to do with them, but in love and the spirit, they are my neighbours. Coming here on the train, I was sitting next door to a lady uh, who told me she works for Christian Aid. So rather than people who give to Christian Aid, and this money being going to people in their fortune countries, um, I'll conjure you to bring their fires near. So this form of inverse perspective, let's call it, with the distance it comes near, shows us that space doesn't matter ones are made. The third form of perspective um, is the inverse perspective. If we look at the um, pedestal where Mary is standing, the sides of it, instead of vanishing into a distance, we are the vanishing point. The lines converge amongst the viewers. So on the one hand, while we are contemplating this, God is contemplating us through the eye So we are the vanishing point from God's point. Yeah. I think in our perverse egocentric world, we think we're the centre of the world, and, we don't, and in a sense we are, and Paul puts us at the centre of this love and attention. But um, the eye helps us to see that we're being contemplated as well as us contemplating. I remember when I was studying in English literature at university, um, we were looking at um, 17th century literature, and the professor said, um, concerning this particular piece of writing, this man said that uh, if God stopped looking at us, we'd all disappear. Ha ha ha, that's not a silly idea. But it stuck in my mind, and uh, later I said, became a Christian. I thought, yes, actually, that's true. If God stopped looking at us, there's nothing to die, it cease to exist. So this inverse perspective um, helps us to realize that God is looking at us, God is contemplating us. Another um, fourth aspect of um, icon perspective is its flatness. You see on the left here a later page in the denunciation where um, depth is being introduced. You see that the archangel is actually behind the pillar, and the pillars um, are going in a sort of a, a point in the distance. Whereas in the traditional icon, the right the building is that there are always behind the figures. It's a sort of flatness, as everything has been squashed into a um, sense of death. And this is because the icon doesn't want to imitate something, it isn't trying to be something it can't be. It is being what it is, which is an image, it's not reality. It's a flat piece of wood, a painting of it. So it's reminding us of flatness that, yeah, I can draw my beauty, but I want to go through my beauty to beauty itself. I want to experience enunciation for the sun. Pope Benedict the 16th said in an address to artists, beauty, whether that of the natural universe or that expressed in art, precisely because it opens up and broadens the horizons of human awareness, pointing us beyond ourselves, bringing us face to face with the abyss of infinity, can become a path towards the transcendent, towards the ultimate mystery, towards God. And this is why the icon tradition has rejected um, great depth in its pictures. It's always trying to have us pass through itself to the ultimate beauty. The um, fifth point I want to raise is uh, I've got a glove's label. Can we possess the promised land of our foot or the kick of a mouse? Here we have an icon I've done with um, Jacob having a battle with an angel. If you remember the, um, the, the event, um, he meets his man and the Lord of Life it comes out as an angel. And Jacob doesn't want to let the angel go until he's been blessed. So in the end, the angel blesses him and says, From now on, the name will be used for him. And of course, Jacob becomes uh, the, the father, if you like, of, of Israel. But this only happens because he battles with God. He, 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 um, he, he knows he's in relationship with the living God, and he must be, he must be something effort into it. So to produce great icons, we need 
labor being skilled, which is a long, long time, and um, the demand, the data type of geography of our time, so that it takes 20,000 hours to get a really efficient hydrography. I figured that if you were put into spare there, you'd have slow times in it. <laughs> I figured that if you worked 40 hours a day, that's 10 years. I think it's updated to 20,000, because a few years ago, here it would say 10,000. So we need, we need struggle, we need effort to gain skill, but also we need ascetic struggle so we can know the Lord Himself in our own hearts. Remember, the greats were actually from the promised land, but to get to the promised land, the spies had to walk there, they had to make a struggle to walk there, they couldn't just they had to click them out, so all of the greats from Amazon had actually been there themselves. I like, to think, I like to think that icon painting is composing a symphony. So the first thing is to have the music of heaven in our soul. So when we are faced with the choice, do I use this note or that note, or this harmony or that harmony? If I have the music of heaven in my soul, I'll know what's concordant with that and what's discordant. And as we're painting an icon, I have a sense that we have the music of heaven in my soul. These colours are appropriate or not. This form, this movement is appropriate or not. But to have that music requires aesthetic struggle. So an icon painter is a faster. They fast, they pray, they live a moral life. Not for its own sake, so that they can have this music in heaven in their souls. Ultimately, I think the canon of iconography. People write sometimes that it's a set of rules that I can follow. I've never actually read these book of rules myself, I don't think they exist. But the canon rule is ultimately the Holy Spirit within the church and within the iconography. It's a living canon. I come now to my sixth characteristic of um, divine beauty. It's in perfection. I was some years in Mount Atapot, so the Vera Monastery and the Abbot of the Sea, which was wonderful. Sand. Don't forget either that there's a perfect imperfection and there's an imperfect perfection. Yeah, they're stuck with them. Let's look at this icon and say, what about this? He's not a particularly attractive figure, is he? He's got skinny eyes, some icons have really sort of tears like the male sticking out. He's emaciated. So sometimes these imperfection icons are deliberate to lead us to the ultimate beauty. But look at um, his face, he's got an ability about him. He's, he's, uh, he's an ascetic, he's lived in the desert, fast and continue, but he has compassion, he has wisdom. This is sad, it's not because he himself is sad in himself, but he feels compassion for our suffering. He's an ability about him. The beauty of icons avoids sense mentality. Because uh, it wants to be a flower that's fertilized and dying so that we can become, become seed, we can become a plant, we can go to the source of it. One uh, other example of um, what I'm saying that um, beauty culminates in action, and sometimes some people create beauty later, the fertilized seed there um, doesn't look so attractive, but in fact the beauty is inherent in it, in the room as it were. That rather uh, unsightly thing is the fertilized flower, the thing that becomes a beautiful plant. An example from another culture of, of, um, of perfect imperfection is what's called wabi sabi in, um, in Japan. This uh, dual term combines uh, wabi, which means tranquility, peace, and stillness, with sabi, which means something ancient of grace. Something that has scars with our proof experience. So when they were near a broken pot, they don't try to make that break disappear. They actually, in this case, put gold on it. So they actually show that imperfection can be beautiful. It has a sort of nostalgic element to it. It reminds of what that pot was like before it's broken. The intention was broken, it makes it beautiful. Even the pot itself, before it's broken, you can see the imperfections in it. It's obviously made by hand, imperfections, point to a higher perfection. From the light of I have this card in my studio, 
Many drugs go off, but this become more important. It's probably sort of dignified old men with age and grace. So I thought that was really sweet. We tend to think of um, age as part of the younger men, more men. We don't mind that. It shows that there's beauty in these men. We come now to our final point, which is beauty, divine beauty, culminates in union with God. So divine beauty is reflected in created beauty, but at the same time infinitely surpasses it. Creative beauty being created is insufficient food for the human soul. Creative beauty is the entree, but not the full meal. It makes us desire more to find communion and have communion with beauty's source. The scriptures begin with Adam and Eve and Eden as a sort of betrothal, but the scriptures end in a marriage of Christ with his bride in the new, in the new Jerusalem. These are two of the many manuscripts I've been on the left. You see the creation of the world, and on the right, the New Jerusalem. And everything I would say in paradise, in the beginning of the scriptures, is a physical manifestation of something whose prototype, this archetype, comes in the New Jerusalem. So in the book of Genesis, it describes the God made of water, made the sun, made the animals, made the plants. But all these were just a little indication of the greater union and the greater beauty. So in Revelation chapter 2, the last book of the Bible, the Apostle John describes the city. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life. So the water of Eden now becomes the water of life. It was as bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and from the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. So all the creatures created in the book of Genesis, as it were, looking forward to the Lamb, Christ, who was saying to us. And he says, this river flew, flowed through the middle of the street in the city. So we start with the garden at the end of the city, a vertical city, but a city. All five of us has moved from the high point to to the source of beauty itself. On either side of the river, John says, is the tree of life. With its trough finds fruit, producing its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nation. So I think when we start with the tree of knowledge of the need, which if we have partaken of the thanksgiving, if we have partaken of the creative work of thanksgiving, we would have been prepared to receive the tree of life from the river. So here, in the New Jerusalem, we have the tree of life available. Nothing occurs to be found in the New Jerusalem anymore, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and the servants will worship it. They will see his face and his name be on their foreheads. There will no more be night, and need no light or lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. So the beauty of paradise leads to the beauty of Christ himself. We won't even need the sun because we have the sun himself. So beauty always has an element of the nostalgic element, of yearning. It reminds us of a homeland which Christ, who is the man of the living, the Bible says. I love those verses in uh, St. Peter's uh, second epistle. 2 Peter 1, verses 3 and 4. He says, God's divine power has given us everything we need from God in love. Through our knowledge of heaven, who has called us to his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through these promises, you may participate in the divine nature. Not, not follow God at a distance, participate partake in the divine nature. I think this is something that's always been central to Orthodox, to the Orthodox Church's teaching, that it's been sort of sadly forgotten about somewhat in the West. I think it's returning now through the icon of the heart, the deification, union of God, what we all call to. And here, Peter is very explicit. These promises are given that we may partake in the divine nature. One of the fathers said that God became man, so man by grace can become God. And of course, 
was Peter knew what he was talking about. He was present at the transfiguration. He had actually seen the glory of the Lord when he was present at Pentecost. Do you think about the union with Christ through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? And all of us, of course, through the Christmasian, are given the Holy Spirit so that we can be in union with Him. The Holy Spirit is beauty in the sun. It's a beauty, glory, and light that inexplicably linked together. Going back to um, Moses' encounter with God, Moses says, Who shall I tell the Israelites sent me? And the Lord replied, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites I am the sent me to you. That's in the Hebrew. In the Septuagint Greek translation, it's slightly different. Instead of I am who I am, it says, I am the existing one. God in your form. So here in the halo of Christ, you have the cross, and you have this term for on, existing one. The light always points us, reminds us that we have light, but God alone is this light. We have light, but God himself is light itself. But we notice here the word for on. Existing one. It's not only within a halo which represents Christ's divinity, but also within a cross. We can only uh, find union with the Lord through tough love, through suffering, through the cross, through the cross and resurrection. Remember the fertilized flowers died to produce seed and produce a new plant. The cross lies between Eden and the new Jerusalem. Beauty can save the world, but only really through trial.